Thanks for coming so early in the morning. And thank you, Creative Mornings. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, and thank you, Galvanize, for hosting this event. Uh, it's really interesting to be here because I had never been to a Creative Mornings uh, event before. But I'll definitely be a regular from now on. Um, so I'm Rohana. Uh, I was born in Dhaka, Bangladesh. And today's topic, justice, it's very fitting for me. And by the end of this presentation, you will probably think so too. So let's go back to the very beginning. Um, this is the house uh, I pretty much grew up in. This is the rooftop, and it almost looks the same, except we're surrounded by uh, high-rise buildings now. But this was in the 80s. Um, this is the beginning of my life. Uh, those of you who don't know where Bangladesh is, uh, it's a country in South Asia. It's surrounded by India on one side and Burma on another. Uh, Burma is now known as Myanmar. Um, you've probably heard of Bangladesh in the sense that uh, we produce a lot of fast fashion right now in the world, like Zara and Forever 21, Gap, etc. Um, it's also in the news a lot because of natural disasters. We're at risk of going underwater because of climate change. Um, so I was born there. I was um, I pretty much went to school there, and um, my parents tried to give me uh, an education and a childhood that they never had. Uh, which meant that I did a lot of uh, creative things like singing, dancing, and art growing up. So this was me as a kid uh, participating in a competition. Uh, I never won, but my mom still used to take me. And I remember it being very torturous as a kid. I, Even though I enjoyed drawing, but uh, when it came, because I never won. It, I, and when I used to go to these events, um, to the competitions, I used to see so many uh, talented kids who are obviously more talented than I, but uh, now I do question that. <laughs> uh, I came to college in the US uh, when I was 19 years old. Uh, it was. Uh, definitely a strange move because I went to college in South Carolina. Uh, I had very little idea of one African Americans and two American history at the time. So being in South Carolina straight from Bangladesh was, what can I call it? Eye opening, traumatizing, um, I don't know. But it definitely added to the experience of learning different sides of America. So the college I went to was called Winthrop. Uh, I double majored for a really long time uh, in journalism and fine art. Uh, this was this picture was taken in a moment uh, when towards the end of my college career, actually. Uh, I used to at that point my art was very abstract. Uh, select journalism moments. Um, honestly, my I really wanted to study just art, but my parents were dead against it, and um, so. But however, I did also love journalism too, so I can't even lie. Um, I did enjoy it, and in fact, now I think about uh, my journalism classes in college a lot. So after college, I had to move back to Bangladesh. It was recession in the US, and nobody was looking for reporters that looked like me. Also, I had a pretty strong accent back then. Uh, I moved back, and I started, <clears throat> I started working in advertising. And um, this ad, I'm going to show you an ad, and this was for a brand called Merrill, um, which is a soap brand. And let me see. Shoot. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, how do I play this? So this ad was very relevant to the next piece of art that I did, which was a huge, huge, um, Okay, hold on, hold on. We have no audio. Hatta thollo, dhori thaklo. Airport bollo, chalo baashai thaki. At taakhuni amar moni holo. It's working. Extra fresh money, extra kichu. Amar skin aro soft, aro fresh. No tune Meryl Splash Extra Fresh. Freshness er shathe extra kichu. Diye char pachhur pa de, ori attention. Amar kintu bhalui lagche. Um. So 
sorry, it's getting stuck. But yeah, um, once I started working on copywriting, uh, I did realize that I definitely missed the journalism side of things, as in doing more relevant work, uh, things that actually have an impact versus just writing ads and that kind of stuff. So the next uh, piece I'm going to show you, it's called 3GP. Uh, this was my first uh, real big exhibition in Bangladesh. Uh, it was uh, in, an, in a competition or in an uh, exhibition called uh, National, which is curated by the government. And uh, before I did have shows in Bangladesh as a teenager or even as a child, but this was my first like legitimate recognition in Bangladesh as an artist because when I moved back from the US, uh, I definitely faced a lot of cultural um, identity crisis and definitely had a lot of trouble fitting in with local artists because they would look at me like, oh, she thinks she's better than me because she studied art in the US or whatever. But uh, once I got in this show, we were showing on the same platform and um, this piece itself is based on Meryl Soap uh, related to that soap ad I just showed you because uh, this piece is based on revenge porn. The time I made it, it was in 2010. This exhibition happened in 2010. Uh, the, one of the, um, the brand ambassador for Meryl Soap at the time, she had been framed in this uh, whole revenge porn thing that was going on. And as in like her boyfriend had leaked a video of hers. And <clears throat> that resulted in one, uh, her being shamed extremely by society. She was dropped from all her projects and she basically became a recluse. Um, so I tried to portray uh, what I thought was going on as well as, so this is an interactive piece. So when you walk into the installation, uh, you have a decision to make. Will you add more stigma to her body or will you wipe it off with the soap and water provided? So to make it a whole experience, uh, I also shot a video for this piece. Uh, I'm just going to like skim through it. Because very, very long. So this video is mainly about how her life, once she, once she's dropped and everything, how she's stuck and cannot move forward. made of Meryl packaging and she's hiding behind it. Uh, I basically tried to provide the kind of anxiety she must have been feeling at the time. And uh, since I was still working in advertising at that time as well, um, I saw how it was taken by the advertising industry itself as in this piece of revenge porn was actually hosted on our shared folder at the office, as in my coworkers were sharing it. So it was basically like when I moved back from the US to Bangladesh, it like all hit me how misogynistic it was, how backward it was, how I couldn't fit in there either anymore. Um, I eventually ended up moving to Thailand to study graphic design. And um, this is an ad I was shooting with uh, for a climate change campaign while I was there. Uh, so I did definitely uh, continue being a copywriter, but I wanted to incorporate more. I wanted to be more, I guess. I wanted to be on the road to being a creative director, so I felt like I already had the copywriting experience. I needed to go to the next level by learning the design side more, since I already had a fine art background. Uh, this is what my art used to look like when I lived in Bangkok. It was very abstract. I, I, even though I had started using recycling and uh, that kind of materials like dumpster diving stuff already, but in Thailand it escalated. Uh, also, I started to, even though I was using typography before too, I really fell in love with typography while I was there, especially learning how to read and write Thai. Uh, the next painting that I started in Bangkok, that actually I would say set everything off. Um, I started working on it in Bangkok in 2012 while I was still there, and it actually took me five years to complete. Uh, meanwhile, I immigrated to the US. I started, uh, I lived in Portland for a bit and then I moved to Seattle. Uh, when I started this painting, I honestly did not know that this painting, what this painting was about. I just knew that I had drew inspiration from the uh, Afghanistan war with the US. Like it had a huge impact on me when America invaded Afghanistan. And when I saw um, 
these blue burqas in, in the newspaper, it had, something had struck in me. But however, when I started this painting though, I literally did not know who or what it was about. Uh, but five years later, uh, when I completed it, I realized it was about me. Um, so I called it Never Stop Questioning because I feel like even though I was raised in a society that literally does not teach women to speak up, uh, that was not going to be me. Uh, I, even though like, I felt like I had a ball gag in my mouth, uh, I was going to still speak up. So, but then, so this like, took me to a whole different level of where I wanted to go with my art and I feel like I could only do it by rewinding and going back and delving into my history, where I came from, why I was the way I was. And um, so I'm going to go back to British India. We were colonized by the British for 200 years. Um, when India's partition happened in 1947, both my grandparents, my paternal and maternal grandparents were both affected. Um, my uh, mom's parents were in Delhi, so they literally had to uh, work through the riots into Pakistan. Uh, she, from what I heard, my grandmother my grandparents were in a train on the way to Punjab when, uh, and the, the train uh, compartment was full of dead bodies. When they tried to open the window to get some fresh air, a bullet grazed her leg. So that was her experience moving to Pakistan. Uh, my uh, paternal grandparents, my dad's parents, they actually were in West Bengal in Kolkata, and at the time it was called Calcutta. And uh, they also were displaced, uh, but their displacement happened towards the end of World War II and to the, towards the beginning of partition. So they were displaced to Bangladesh. Uh, these are my grandparents in Delhi in 1947. Uh, actually, they're my mom's parents. Uh, and then, sorry. And then these are my dad's parents in Calcutta. So moving on, my mom was born in Pakistan in Rawalpindi. This is my mom. And my dad was born in Bangladesh. So during the partition of India, basically India was broken into two parts, India and Pakistan. One of the parts of Pakistan was what is now Bangladesh. It was called East Pakistan at the time. So my mom was actually raised in West Pakistan and my dad was raised in East Pakistan. This is my dad in the 1960s. He was a student leader. This is him leading a protest. So literally the reason why my parents met was because of 1971, after our war started, because of people like my dad who were student leaders who instigated a movement and became key figures in our liberation movement. Um, while this is going on, my mom is in Pakistan and they, during, after our war, my, par my mom's parents and her, they became refugees, they were asked to leave and return to uh, East Pakistan where they were originally from. And once they did, uh, they, they moved back to Bangladesh and that's how my parents met. Uh, this is a picture of my dad from the war. Uh, this, is my, this is a picture of my dad from uh, the day of our liberation, December 16, 1971. He's actually walking war collaborators to their death. So fast forward to now, um, or fast forward to me immigrating to the States, uh, it was a life of struggle as an immigrant. Uh, when you first get here, you, nobody, I mean, you don't get opportunities, it's very hard. So doing art on top of that was a struggle, but I did uh, do some. This was a life painting I did towards, my, towards the first year or so of me being here. Uh, some other paintings I was working on, I did notice that I was more and more interested in moving away from abstract work and doing more narrative work like this one, which is based on vaping being banned in Thailand because the tobacco industry has such a hold on them. Uh, this was based on the Rohingya crisis in Burma and about violent monks. Uh, I did this painting about my dad last year. So last year I would say was the most productive year of my life. I really pushed myself and this year I'm feeling the burnout. But <laughs> I pushed myself on many levels, and so um, I actually decided to move to doing more large-scale paintings. Uh, this painting is, I think, uh, about seven feet by six feet. Uh, this is a painting, uh, this is an, I don't know how to describe this. 
installation, I guess, of paintings uh, from my show called, uh, I was on a show last year called My Bay America. Uh, this installation, each piece is based on my brother's experience of Islamophobia in America. Uh, so I'll just go through it very quickly. The first one, the one at the very top, is about how he cannot pray in public in fear of getting killed. The second one is about how he can't expose that his name is Muslim, just because he'll be labeled. Uh, these two, the next two, are about how he is afraid of his religion being exposed and that being a problem. And then he's also scared of his children's religion if being found out as Muslim and that being a problem. Uh, the fear of can't not being able to grow a beard, his wife's fear of not being able to wear a hijab, his fear of being labeled as a terrorist because he's brown, and never being able to express his opinion as a Muslim from a Muslim perspective. Uh, this was another painting in My Bay America. This is about Colin Kaepernick. Uh, I realized at this point that I was more interested in uh, doing more narrative work as well as uh, really highlighting things that move me, people that move me. And um, I really appreciated and appreciate what Colin, Colin Kaepernick did. I think it was very brave. And I saw the split in the US and in you know the stance people are taking and have been taking, but it was a moment that I wanted to remember forever, and this is why I did this. Uh, this was another painting in that show. Um, it's about myself not belonging here or back home. It's called Immigrants Never Belong. Uh, this is one of the last paintings I did last year. It's called Disbelief 2018, an American political saga. This is about so many things that were happening in 2018, from gun control to um, Brett Kavanaugh being elected as a Supreme Court justice, um, child separations, climate change, forest fires. So it was like a whole culmination. Um, and then right here is a clear plastic bag for children to go to school with. This year, I was selected as a storefronts artist. Uh, this was an installation I did in Renton. This piece is called Justice. And it's inspired by four women from the Indian subcontinent. The first story is about Malala. Uh, she, was, she won the Nobel Prize. She was shot point blank in Swat Valley, Pakistan, for not stopping going to school. Um, her education was more important to her, and that's why she was shot. Uh, so for Malala's piece, I chose, uh, okay, so many, many things about this installation. One, I, it couldn't be graphic because it was a public piece. So I chose to depict all the violent parts with felt so that it would soften the piece. Um, so for Malala's piece, it's showing uh, the part of her brain that needed to be reconstructed, uh, the 45 caliber bullets that hit her, and a book from Pakistan. Uh, I think it was uh, actually an English book, a textbook. The second story is about Bonna. She was married to, she is married to Obijit Roy. She, he was a blogger and a writer, and he was actually killed in Bangladesh while visiting a book fair. Uh, he, this is his book, uh, which is a banned book. It's on homosexuality. And this is uh, a machete that has an Islamic prayer on it. Uh, on the floor is Bonna's thumb that was severed during this attack. The next story is about Nirbhaya. She was a girl who was gang raped in a bus in Delhi. It was, uh, it was a very, uh, how can I describe it? Extremely traumatizing news in 2012, December. And I actually remember what, when she, the movie she even, she was going to watch, it was The Life of Pi. And uh, anyway, she was on the bus, she was going, or she was actually on the way home from watching that movie when she was attacked. Uh, for her piece, I chose the bus, the model of the bus she was in, and uh, her severed intestines hanging from the other part of the scale. For the last uh, scale, I chose Taslima Nasrin, who is one of my personal idols. She was banned from Bangladesh in 1994. She has been in exile ever since. Uh, the reason she was banned was also because of a book, and that book was about Hindu-Muslim uh, violence. And um, so on one side of her scale is her book, and she was actually a doctor, so a, st a stethoscope, and on the other side is her passport that has never been renewed. 
So moving on to present day, the stuff I'm doing now. Last year, I decided to pursue a really crazy idea and uh, make a documentary on the election in Bangladesh. Uh, this is, these are some select moments from it. I'm Rohanna, I'm 33 years old. I'm an artist and I live and work in Seattle, Washington. Between October and December this year, Bangladesh will have a general election. And for the first time ever, I'm going to exercise my right to vote. Like, so say in Bangladesh now, you know, we're supposed to have an election in December, but um, it may or may not happen. So we're on the brink of autocracy. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Good luck. Um, it, it couldn't be worse than the United States right now, do you think? So, so you're here right now, and now we think that would make it a little easier not being actually in the country. Does it ever make you nervous about going back to Bangladesh after having been involved in a project like this? Yeah. Elections are happening in exactly 16 days. <laughs> আমরা <laughs> জড়িত না লেকিন আমাদের ভরা দিছে ভুয়া মামলা So this is the kind of work I'm doing right now. Uh, this is going, this painting is going to be in my show. That's opening on 5th September, first Thursday in Pioneer Square, in, and it's going to be at the TK. Uh, this painting is about uh, taking control of my life again, um, and it's actually telling a story of my life where um, I was age, I was seven years old, and this moment is the moment when I was molested. Uh, both my grandparents, my uh, grandmothers were child brides. My mom's mom was married when she was five. My dad's mom was married when she was 12. So I'm doing a series based on them and their experiences. Uh, another video project that I've been working on since last year is called Make America. It's about, um, immigrant stories. So this is uh, one that I shot. This was actually the first one where I interviewed a DACA recipient. How old were you when you first came to America? Um, well, my mom brought me to one of the border crossing zones and uh, I was three and she just passed me to my aunt. And so that was that. Uh, this is uh, this is another one from the same episode. How old were you when you oh, first wait, no, came to America? Oh wait, no, this is the same one. Sorry. <laughs> Do you identify as American? I don't. I self-identify as Mexican. Um, you've spent. You've been here since you were three. Mm -hmm. So, you've pretty much spent your whole life here. Mm -hmm. Why is your Mexican identity in the forefront versus American? Because it's what people see, you know, regardless if I was an American or not. At the end of the day, when I walk into an establishment, like you don't see an American, you see a brown person, you know, and then you assume maybe a Mexican person. And so that being said, I mean, I, I think it's, I think it makes sense. I am a Mexican person. 
So the idea for that series is that I'm going to do more and more immigrant stories and cover stories that are lost from the mainstream media. Uh, another thing I'm working on is artwork on partition because uh, based on my grandparents' experiences. And this year, earlier this year, I was in India. It was a very emotional experience. This is a little poem I had written while I was there. I was actually sitting at the Indian Museum when I wrote it. But it was very real that being a brown person, we're separated by borders that shouldn't exist. And that is all. That's the end of my story. Thank you. Hey, Ro. Hi, Chris. What's <laughs> up? <laughs> we know each other. Um, we were kind of uh, workshop in this question. You're using your advertising background. How do you kind of see it, how it's affected your fine art marketing and how you see yourself getting a, get a greater audience using your fine art, using your advertising background and your fine art to make yourself a better artist? I totally see it. Uh, Chris and I used to work at Publicis together. Um, even while I was preparing this presentation, I was just like, wow, I've gotten really good at PowerPoint. How did that happen? <laughs> but I totally see it in terms of, uh, say, branding. Um, when I started my brand, 1971, which is this and this, um, in terms of creating the logo, how, like, the branding guidelines and what, like, my vision for my brand, I feel like if I did not work in advertising, if I was not a copywriter, these things would have not been as easy for me as it has been. Uh, it also helps in terms of I'm a very planned person, like uh, I keep uh, detailed uh, notes. I have a calendar that I use five highlighters on on the regular, uh, a lot of to-do lists. And things like that I feel like have come from advertising where you're working under a high stress uh, environment with deadlines and uh, you have to deliver on time. And so the time management and project management has definitely helped my arts. However, on the flip side though, when I, in terms of brain capacity, because I'm at capacity working 40 hours on copywriting, which is a very intense uh, brain job, as in I'm always having to think about stuff, uh, it takes away time from my fine art. As in if I were to dedicate that time to art, just the thinking process, then I would be able to do so much more but um, at the same time, though, I'm doing it. But I don't know. I feel like it's always pros and cons with everything, though. So, but it has helped. Come on. Hello. Hi. Um, <laughs> you you were mentioning like burnout from last year, and you worked really hard. And we were kind of talking about, uh, I guess, what's your toolkit for dealing with, um, you know. Um, just being an artist, but you know you're dealing with a lot of really intense um, pieces and um, things that are happening around the world, and uh, kind of yeah, how do you deal with all of that, you know, and still be capable of producing um, the stuff you're doing? Toolkit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a toolkit. If you have one, please share it with I know, me. I don't. <laughs> Maybe we got the meditation. Uh, retreat from this guy. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I feel like I jumped into it without thinking. In fact, I jump into things without thinking it through, uh, which is a good thing. But at the same time, I definitely feel that I sometimes take on too much, more than I can deliver, and you know, more than it's possible to humanly deliver. Um, so one might the topics I choose, they are intense because I'm an intense person. Like, I, that cannot be helped. Um, but how do you recover from working on that stuff? When I worked, when I went and shot uh, Days to D Democracy, which was my documentary that I showed you guys, uh, I, when I came back, I was mentally so messed up. Uh, I think it took me at least three months to just remember who I was before I left on the strip. Um, but I feel like time will heal. Uh, it's definitely a healing experience, and definitely painting helps me heal myself in many ways. Uh, it's kind of like the subconscious takes over, and it will show me things. It's kind of like a premonition in a way. Like Through paintings, I'm shown things that my subconscious wants to work with, but my 
actual brain that's conscious is not aware of. So that definitely helps, but yeah, I, I mean, I could use more healing and a toolkit for sure. So uh, our question really relates to these last two questions. We were wondering two things really. With, with work that's so inspiring and consuming, how do you make a living to pay the bills and handle the other aspect of life? And then also with work that's so heavy, what do you do to balance that on the lighter side to enjoy and release you know, some happier feelings? So the first question, what I do for a living, I still work as either a copywriter or a graphic designer. Um, right now I'm on contract as a, what is it called? They call it a contingent worker at Facebook. So I'm, copy I'm still copywriting and that pays my bills. Um, I try to alternate, I'm a freelancer, so I'll do one contract in copywriting, the next one I'll switch it up and do it in graphic design just so I don't lose those skills. But definitely when I'm doing one, I miss the other, and I'm just like, dang, I should not be doing this, I should be doing something else. But in reality though, that's just how it goes. Um, in terms of healing and stuff, uh, I would say when I first moved to the States, I mean not first, but when I moved to the States as an immigrant, uh, I, I sought counseling and I still seek counseling because there is no way I could heal on my own. Um, did that answer your question? I actually forgot what the second part was. <laughs> what do you do to be happy? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> uh, I feel like, okay, so I don't focus on being happy. I focus on doing my work, as in I look at it as I have limited time here. I could just literally die tomorrow. I could die in the next hour and my story would be untold. My artworks would just be ideas and nobody would be able to follow up on them. So I feel like, you know, I don't have time to waste on wallowing or being on emotions. I need to be a machine that just produces, especially in terms of my legacy, in terms of my family history. I feel like it's very important and I feel a calling to tell that story in either painting or video or whatever it is. But yeah, counseling helps for sure. <laughs> I also do, I also take care of a lot of plants. I love plants, so I feel like that's a balance. Uh, I paint a lot. Um, so yeah, those things, but uh, in Seattle, de happiness is rare, I'll say that. <laughs> uh, I actually looked up, and in fact, I'm going to be working on a piece that I looked up uh, how many sunny days there are in Seattle. There's 152. So other than those 152 days, I'm probably very sad. <laughs> So you've shared with us a real broad array of experiences, um, and there's the global, the political, all the way down to the very personal. Do you have a vision for the future, however you want to answer that, globally or personally? Uh, I mean, in very broad terms, yes. Uh, I found that I don't set short-term goals for myself like that. I mean, I do on some levels, but they're very loose. They're loose goals. Like, as a child, I idolized uh, this writer, filmmaker, artist called Shottajit Rai. Um, he's from West Bengal. He was one of the first, in fact, he was the first Indian to ever win an Oscar. So as a kid, I was very inspired by his books, his illustrations, his way of thinking, and also his filmmaking. So I would say my loose goal has always been to be him in many ways. And you know, so I've done the advertising. He was also a graphic designer, like a visualizer. Um, he wrote books. I mean, I haven't gone there yet, but maybe. <laughs> but like, he was an illustrator, I draw. He was a painter, I paint. Uh, next, he made films, so that's where I'm going. Um, but beyond that, I honestly don't think about it. We were inspired by your Make America, um, and we were curious what your vision for women for the future would be. For American women? Or just women. Um, I actually just read this week that for equality, it will take America 200 more years for men and women to be treated as equal. Um, in terms of Make America, uh, my vision for Make America is uh, like, for example, the next stories I want to tell are about the Vietnam War. 
um, about Syria, you know, like people, or even like border separations happening right now. Uh, that's my focus for Make America. For women, uh, for me personally, uh, the election of 2016 was very difficult. It was like a slap on my face when Donald Trump won because as much as you don't agree with Hillary Clinton, she's clearly more qualified for the job. Um, so it felt like, you know, in many ways, it's been a reality check for me because I came to America thinking that women are treated differently here, only to realize it's only on the surface for the most part. Um, but yeah, I mean, for women, I feel like, but however, I will say my Instagram feed right now it does give me a lot of hope because I see women, even women from Bangladesh, uh, just rejecting patriarchy in so many ways and that's really hopeful for me. It gives me a lot of inspiration. And um, actually my painting, Disbelief, which is, that's one reason why I chose to depict two women on there, uh, Christine Blasey Ford and Emma Gonzalez, because I feel like that's the women of the future. Hello. Um, so we were discussing that a lot of women, when they speak, will add like softening words in the middle of sentences to sort of like bring people into their realm and make it more relatable for other people. Do you think that that happens in your work at all? We noticed that you use a lot of like bright colors, um, and some of the meaning could be like construed as maybe lighter, but often your paintings had heavy topics. So how does being a woman um, actually affect how you portray your art? That's such an interesting question because I've never thought about it that way. Uh, about the colors, I feel like uh, Bangladesh and in fact India and South Asia itself is very colorful. Uh, we always, our clothes, everything is very full saturation over there. Um, so I feel like from my childhood, especially like that picture I showed you guys of the competition I was working with, oil pastels, uh, those were full saturation oil pastels. So I feel like that's something that has stayed with me. That's what I like. I don't think being a woman has anything to do with that. But being a woman has everything to do with all the artwork I do, for sure. Um, I don't use soft words. I mean, I'm a copywriter, but I'm not really aware of the words I use, to be honest, because I'm just trying to get the idea out for the most part. Um, so, I mean, I honestly don't, I mean, one, I don't like being labeled as a woman. I mean, I just, I don't, I, I've always had a problem with genders, um, mainly because I was forced to fit into the box of what it means to be a woman in Bangladesh. Um, so, you know, I would never honestly put any thought to, okay, let me use this word to make myself look soft and female. Uh, no, I'm, I want to be on the same stage as men. And yeah. 